the president and Democrats are facing the difficult reality that their hopes to pass sweeping election reform bills are all but dead. Tuesday, the Senate will take up their legislation, but it is expected to fail without the support of any Republicans and the refusal by two Democratic senators to change the rules of the Senate to pass the bill with just 51 votes as opposed to 60. It will be a devastating blow for President Biden's agenda and also his political capital after President Biden put the weight of his office and his reputation as a unifier behind the rules change, delivering a withering speech in Atlanta aimed at opponents of election reform and the filibuster change and going to Capitol Hill Thursday to rally his party and still failing to convince Senators Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, as well as perhaps other Democratic senators, to change the filibuster rules. Joining me now, someone who has been fighting for election reform and voting rights his entire career, the House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn, Democrat of South Carolina. Uh, Majority Whip Clyburn, thanks so much for joining us. Before we dive into the issues, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. What are you thinking about this weekend as one of the last prominent civil rights heroes from that era? Well, thank you very much for having me, Jed. You know, I spent a lot of time on yesterday, uh, the actual birthday, reflecting on King's letter from the Birmingham City Jail. Uh, that letter, I reread that letter every year. Uh, and I always get something out of it uh, that I didn't see there before. And I focused yesterday on his whole question of why we can't wait. Silence. All these questions that King uh, left with us. He said to us in that letter something that is very, very, uh, I would call it consequential today. And that is that silence gives consent. We have too much silence in the face of what's going on around us today. I remember uh, corporations stepping up when Georgia was passing uh, those draconian uh, voter laws down there. All of a sudden now, they have gone silent. And King told us in that letter that we are going to be made to repent, not just for the vitriolic words and deeds of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. That's what I was thinking about all yesterday. That's interesting because um, Hillary Clinton tweeted a, a famous quote from that letter um, from the Birmingham jail, and it was about the white moderate. Uh, Hillary Clinton tweeted, Martin Luther King Jr. said, quote, I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exist for the purposes of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that blow the flow of social progress, unquote. Then Hillary Clinton added, quote, this is a subtweet. Um, a subtweet is when you're talking about somebody without naming them. Presumably, uh, Secretary Clinton was talking about Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. Um, as you know, much of that letter is about how allies of the civil rights movement uh, could be more problematic than enemies of the civil rights movement, uh, the white moderate. Do you agree with that comparison? And, and is that what's happening today in the U.S. Senate? I do believe, uh, agree with that. Today is Sunday. If you remember, uh, King was sitting in jail. He received a letter from eight white clergymen who wrote him uh, about their concern. They asked him to leave Birmingham. And they said that they thought his cause was right, but his timing was wrong. And King said to them, time is neutral. Time can either be used destructively or constructively. And that's when he said that he was coming to the conclusion that the people of ill will in our society were making a much better use of time than the people of goodwill. And so I would say that uh, to my friends in the Senate now. People of ill will demonstrated on January 6th how effective they can use their time. Are we going to step up the people of goodwill and use our time more effectively? That letter, you know, I always say, Jack, that uh, aside from the Bible, I do believe that that letter may be the most timeless document I've ever read. So President Biden went to Georgia this week to push for Cinema and Mansion and others to get rid of the filibuster in order to pass 
these two election reform bills, and the president asked this question, quote, do you want to be on the side of Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis? What do you say to Democrats who say that that went too far to compare somebody who opposes changing the filibuster with a traitor who fought a war for slavery? I would ask those people, what do you think uh, is, is going too far? Is it going too far to criminalize giving somebody a bottle of water, standing in line trying to vote, standing in line for four and five hours? Is that going too far? Is it going too far to put in place mechanisms to nullify a vote uh, when people have uh, cast their votes? If you don't like the outcome, then you've got the power uh, to nullify that. Is that going too far? Everything we've seen coming out of Georgia violates the Constitution of the United States of America. And Alexander Hamilton told us in Federalist Papers number 59 that that we cannot leave federal elections and their results up to states. You would have 50 applications of what the law is. So that is what's going too far. And so if anybody going to focus on the speech and pay no attention to the actions, that violates biblical purpose. It's their deeds that really matter, not the words. And for us to focus on the president's words and not pay any attention to the deeds of those legislators in Texas, in Georgia, and 17 other states that passed uh, 35, 34 uh, laws uh, that is draconian when it comes to voting, that's where our attention ought to be. Now, Democrat senators um, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema both support the two election reform legislation bills. They just say they oppose sidestepping the filibuster. I want you to take a listen to what Senator Sinema said during her floor speech this week. Eliminating the 60 vote threshold will simply guarantee that we lose a critical tool that we need to safeguard our democracy from threats in the years to come. Her basic argument is that Republicans are going to take over the chamber at some point, and Democrats are going to need that filibuster. Just last night, Donald Trump called for Republicans to pass stricter laws when it came to the election, voter ID restrictions, to ban drop boxes, stop no excuse absentee voting. Doesn't she have a point that Democrats might need that filibuster as soon as 2025 to, to stop Republicans from imposing even harsher voting restrictions? Look. No, she is not right about that. We just got around the filibuster to raise the debt limit. Why? Because we don't want to put the full faith and credit of the United States at risk. No one has asked her to eliminate uh, the filibuster. The filibuster is there for all of these issues that may be policy issues. But when it comes to the Constitution of the United States of America, no one person sitting downtown in a spa ought to be able to pick up the telephone and say, you are going to put a hold on my ability uh, to vote. And that's what's going on here. So I would wish they would stop that foolish. Because if we do not protect the vote with everything that we've got, we will not have a country uh, to protect going forward. I don't know where we got the notion from uh, that this democracy is here to stay no matter how we conduct ourselves. Our job, when we took the oath, we took the oath of office to protect this country from all uh, enemies, foreign and domestic. There are some domestic enemies that showed up on January 6th, and they didn't stop there. They're still going on. And you hear it when the president tweets out or whatever he says uh, about getting rid uh, of people's convenient voting places, saying to paraplegics, that you, you can't make it convenient for you to vote, saying to 90 year old that you got to stand in line four and five hours to, to vote. And if anybody gives you a glass of water, uh, they will be uh, put in jail. That third world stuff. And we had better be careful. Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego of Arizona is not ruling out a primary challenge against Senator Sinema in 2024. Uh, do you think Senator Sinema should face a primary challenge? Well, I'm, I'm going to stay out of that. I know Ruben. I like Ruben. We work together very closely. 
uh, on these kinds of issues in the House. Uh, and uh, I've really uh, uh, been supporting his re-election. He hasn't said to me that he's going to run uh, for the United States Senate. Uh, I've been supporting him for re-election uh, to the House of Representatives. But we'll see what happens. He's a good guy. Quickly, before we go, sir, um, is, uh, are the election reform bills dead, do you think? No, I don't. Uh, they may be on life support, uh, but, you know, John Lewis and others did not give up after the 64 uh, Civil Rights Act. That's why they got the 65 Voting Rights Act. So I'm going to tell everybody, we aren't giving up. We're going to fight, and we plan to win, because the people of goodwill are going to break their silence and help us win this battle.